بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبته ومن ولا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters, certainly great to be with you even though it is in this way uh, still, you know, the the arwah jun mujannada, right? The souls of people are like soldiers, right? We amass together in the spiritual as well as the physical realm. realm. So alhamdulillah, even though we're not there to see you in New Jersey and, 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 and to be with you, alhamdulillah, you know, the mahabbah and the, the love of that we have for one another, inshallah, transcends physical spaces. Subhanallah, before we start, we want to make dua for everyone that Allah will protect us from the danger of this virus. That if we are in fact infected by this virus, it becomes a means of our forgiveness, our, 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 our purification and kafara for our dhanub. Secondly, we want to think about those who've already been infected by the virus. Just yesterday I heard our Sheikh Hatim Hajj uh, was ill with this virus. We ask Allah to cure him and bless him and all of those. I spoke to a young man yesterday, Anis, in Birmingham, England, who also is, is ill. Uh, so we want to keep those people in our hearts and let them know that we are praying for your shifa. As the Prophet said, Ma Allah has not sent an illness except he sent with it its dawa, its remedy. So we ask Al-Kashif subhanahu wa ta'ala wal alim subhanahu wa ta'ala to uncover for us the mystery of this illness and help us to be inshallah a means of remedying this illness in society. The, the, the discussion that I was asked to address is one which is extremely important because it's one that will not stop until the end of time. And that is what is the future of Islam. We know that one of the remarkable intrinsic qualities of the deen of Al-Islam is that it is the last deen, deen Khalida. It is the last, last deen and because of that it has to constantly maintain a commitment to foundational beliefs and fundamental practices while at the same time being able to, uh, if you will, adapt to certain environmental realities and circumstances. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said in the Qur'an, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ صلى الله عليه وسلم, that you were sent for all creation. تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي نَزَّلَ الْفُرْقَانَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ لِيَكُونَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ نَذِيرًا That the Qur'an is sent to Sayyidina Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, so that he can be, or that it can be, there's two interpretations, either the Prophet or the Qur'an or both. Uh, a reminder for all creation. So one of the beautiful components of Islam is that Islam sadih wa shamil li kulli zamanin wa makanin wa ahwarin wa ashkhas. And I heard this from many of my teachers and especially Sheikh Muhammad Khadr Hussein, who was Sheikh Al-Azhar almost 70 something years ago. He wrote a very beautiful essay that Islam is appropriate for every time, place, culture, situation, and people. SubhanAllah, if we, if we look now, right, at the, the reaction of the world to trying to, to, as they say, you know, slow the curve, if you will, to, to flatten out the curve, their reactions are practices which we do every day. Washing themselves. People now are saying we shouldn't be using toilet paper, it's harming the environment, and then we have water, we can clean ourselves with water. I recently saw a non-Muslim man say that if you were to get dirt on your shoes, would you use water or would you use toilet paper? People use uh, toilet uh, water. He said, SubhanAllah, what about your body? We're seeing people now having to restrict their consumption. We're seeing people now have to restrict their social engagements. These are SubhanAllah, all practices to a certain degree which are balanced and nuanced by our deen. So for us as Muslims, the first thing that we should think about is that in the face of a catastrophe, we see the entire world moving towards things which perhaps we may have taken for granted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udhkuru ni'mati alayk. Remember my blessings upon you. So the first is to think deeply about how, if you want to think about the future of Islam and Islam being something which is constantly, you know, important to people's lives, this is perhaps the greatest human health catastrophe in the last hundred years or so and people are now are in order to to uh, if you will quell the curve if you will or, 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 or increase the inability of this virus to harm people are adopting practices of al-islam subhanallah so that's the first thing that we should become confident in our future not simply because non-muslims are doing what we do that's, that's a dangerous game. But because we're seeing people applying our practices to remedy 
a, a formidable enemy that is not even seen, subhanAllah. The second thing is that there is a historical precedent for many of these things. And I'm not someone who believes that for everything that happens in this modern age, we have to find a historical presence. I think that's a problem. I think that becomes very dangerous. Generally, we can find it in the Quran and generally we can find it in the Sunnah. But as Sayyidina Imam al-Shafi'i said rahimahullah ta'ala that the earlier generations didn't do everything. Right? They didn't accomplish everything. And as he said, al-nusus munhasara wa mu'addada, right? That the sacred texts are limited, but the actions of people are not limited. So there has to be the job of the faqih and the alim to come and marry what we call rabt bayna samai wal ard, to marry the heavens and the earth. But subhanAllah, in the time of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, because we think about the future of Al-Islam and specifically in the context of why Islam, which is doing just transformative work, mashallah. I became Muslim actually reading a pamphlet, Islam at a Glance, from Jamaica, Queens, which was from Ikna. So Ikna shares, mashallah, uh, in my Islam, right? Mandalla ala khayrin falahu ajur mithu fa'ili, whoever guides to good, they get the reward of the one who followed them. So I imagine all those uncles that are ikna and aunties, you know, are getting the ajr from my Islam. Alhamdulillah. And I ask Allah to amplify their ajr. But th there is a number of historical precedents that we can look to for inspiration for the future. And we have to be honest about our application of those historical precedents. What I tend to see is that Muslims fall into two extremes. Number one is they romanticize history to the point that it renders them incapable of living for the future. So the future will never be like the past, so there's no need to try. So the past simply becomes a relic for not critical thought, but for romanticized thought. So Andalus, you know, people are always talking about Andalus. Andal well, if Andalus was so great, why is it gone? You know, people should read, how did Andalus fall? Because the Muslims fought each other and paid non-Muslims to fight their fellow brothers and sisters. That's why they're gone. They were wiped away from the face of the earth. Southern Italy is, is something that Muslims very seldomly talk about. Sicily was pre, you know, predominantly Arab for many years. Why are they gone? Well, very different than Spain. They're gone because of opulence. You know, they just melted into the opulence of Italy. We ask Allah to help the people of Italy now, of course. So instead of romanticizing history, we should think critically and strategically about history. As Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, قُصِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْرِكُمْ Let them traverse the earth and, and deep, unzur means to look and ponder as to those strong nations that came before them. What happened to them? Where are they now? He doesn't say, you know, look back and just be, be you know, romanticizing history. Not إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَعِبْرَةً in history, there is a ibra. Ibra uh, means something that travels. So it travels from the mind to the heart to the limbs. So it becomes a strategy. On the other side, we see people who, we see people who just reject our Islamic history and our scholarly tradition, even though they may claim to be religious. They may have been infected by secular professions where they believe that those secular professions, being a doctor or being an engineer, being a computer scientist, automatically qualifies them to be more intelligent and more knowledgeable than ulama in deen. They may be more knowledgeable in other things and that's where we'll talk about today moving forward what needs to happen is partnerships both need each other but they tend to use the the colonial education system which they have experienced or the post-colonial educational system which is rooted largely in Eurocentricity and white supremacy. We'll use that as an excuse to ignore the voice of the ulama. The third problem is that untrained religious content providers, untrained uh, imams and people that are functioning in these fields don't really have a depth of study. You know, I studied for 17 years and still I, I really feel like I have a lot to accomplish. I, I feel sometimes shy when I see great ulama like, you know, uh, Sheikh uh, Hatim, for example, or Imam uh, Sheikh Yasir Qadi, or, or these, these powerful voices, right? Sheikh Zainab al Awani, who her father was my teacher. You know, I feel shy to, to speak in front of these people, even though I did 10 years in a madrasa and 7 years in Al Azhar. Then I see someone, they, they're just like very, very belligerent 
and they have studied very little. So for example, we see some people now telling people it's far to go to the masjid, you have to go to the masjid, you can't close the masjid. And we're seeing now across the world some areas in Western democracies where the neighborhoods where the Muslims are is where the coronavirus is spreading. So we have three challenges when it comes to history. Number one is romanticized notions, neo-traditionalism, where it's like wearing certain type of clothes, having a certain type of cool language, uh, the authority of the sheikh is kind of imbalanced, right? Then we have those who've rejected history in the name of a secular education and the utility and agency which secular education has given them. And then in the middle, we have oftentimes incompetent fuqaha. Wala hawla wala quwwata illa billah. Is there a historical precedence that we can think about in light of Corona, which may also give us some flashlights to shine onto the future so that we can maybe think strategically about the future of Al-Islam. And I especially want those young brothers and sisters to listen because you are, mashallah, really the future of Al-Islam. And that happened in the 17th, 18th year after the death of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was a plague that took place uh, in an area between uh, uh, Ramla and Quds. And this was called the Tu'an of, of uh, Imwas, I believe. And this happened in the time of Sayyidina Amr ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, who actually was on the way to Bilad al-Sham, on the way to Syria, on the way to the area of Palestine, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And as he got to the border of the Arabian Peninsula and Sham, he was informed that this plague has started. And according to the Imam Ibn Hajar, this was a plague that would actually corrupt people's blood uh, and they would die. Uh, from like serious infections in their blood, may Allah protect us. And Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab, he did a number of things that I think we should think about as we move into the future. Number one, he acted on one of the major principles of Islam, is that dar mufasid yuqaddim ala jalb al-musalih. You know, this is one of the axioms of Islamic law that is almost agreed upon by everybody, which is rare, which is that preventing harm comes before benefit. Preventing harm comes before achieving a benefit. We find this in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yes, Arunaka an al Khamri wal Maisir Kul fihima ithmun kathir. There's a qira kathir wa kabir. Kul fihima ithmun kathiru wa manafi uli nas wa ithmuhuma akthar aw akbaru min nafihima. Allah says, They ask you about gambling and alcohol. Say, In them is a great sin or a considerably large sin. And in them is also benefit. So in alcohol and in gambling, there's, there's a benefit and there's harm. But the harm is greater, the sin is greater. So we see here that murat al mafasid wal musalih, that the faqih, the mufti, the scholar, the shaykh, the Islamic movement, the Islamic organization, the student organization, whoever, the first thing that should be in front of you is not how do you achieve benefit, how do you prevent harm. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, That's why they're haram, because the harm is greater than the benefit. So when Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu arrives at the border of Sham and Zirth al-Arabiyya, he goes back. He puts preventing harm in front of achieving a benefit. And by the way, this takes us to the second point. There were Sahaba who differed with him, like Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. Like Mu'adh ibn Jabal, although they were already in Sham, they differed with him on this issue. And there were Sahaba who agreed with him, like Amr ibn As and others. And that's the second thing, is that if Islam is going to function in the future, we have to tolerate differences, man. Oftentimes I see elders and even young people, man. The most difficult communities I've worked with are young, not old. Subhanallah. You know, thinking that their youth somehow gives them the ability to be right. You ain't lived long enough to know right and wrong, bro. But subhanAllah, we see that Sayyidina Umar, he tolerates differences. So the first is we put harm, preventing harm in front of benefits. So now when, when I wrote the fatwa for, for closing masajid, and I mentioned the statements of Sayyidina Izzi Abdin Abdul Salam in Qawa'id al-Anam fi Masarih al-Anam, you know, in his book where he talks about the foundations of Islamic law, he has وَمِنْهَا تَخْفِيفَ الشَّرَعَ He says in this book, there is a chapter called where you are able to engage in dispensation. وَمِنْهَا إِسْقَاتِ jamaat. And he said, for example, when you can suspend the prayers in the masjid or Salatul Jumu'ah 
We saw a number of people when Amja, they wrote a very great fatwa on this issue, mashallah, Allah bless them. People reacted, we're not closing the masajid, we're not going to listen to anybody. They put Jalb al Musalih in front of Dar al Mafasid. And look what happened. And look what happened. You know, subhanAllah, uh, there's a beautiful statement that I'll talk about in a second of Sufi and Athawri that I want us also to, to think on. I'm going to mention it in a minute. The second thing is that we need to tolerate differences and we need to listen to one another. Even though Sayyidina Amr ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu huwa man huwa, he is who he is, still people differ with him and he doesn't take it personally. Now people take every time someone differs with us, it's a personal issue and we find how many great Islamic organizations in America have splintered into 20, 30 different organizations. How many masajid have splintered into little masajid for Islam to function in the future? Allah said, if you divide, your strength is going to leave you. So the second is we need to tolerate differences and not work on conflict resolution, worked on conflict transformation. The third thing that he did is he took shura. So he asked people, what do you think about this? Some people agreed, some people didn't. That's the third key for the future of Islam in America. We have to communicate effectively. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Allah commanded Sayyidina Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa to engage in shura even though he's ma'asum. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Sayyidina Marzuqi says, وَعِسْمَتُهُمْ كَسَائِلِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَاجِبَةٌ وَفَضَلُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Even though they have isma, the Anbiya, still subhanAllah, the Prophets are protected from sin, still the Prophet takes shura with the sinners. The fourth thing I think that's very important, and, and this is key, is that Muslims, if we're going to succeed in the future, we cannot simply be a reactive community. Especially our ulama, our scholars, and what I've noticed sometimes in our fatawa, our fatawa and our answers are living in the past, not living for the future. But look at Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he puts preventing harm in front of benefit as a strategy, as a, as a major ethos of Islam. When he says to Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, that if it wasn't that your people just became Muslim, I will order the Kaaba to be destroyed and rebuilt on the foundations of Sayyidina Ibrahim. After they conquered Mecca, we know that the Quraysh, they messed up when they rebuilt the Kaaba, they rebuilt it on the wrong foundations. It wasn't on Qawa'id Ibrahim or Ismail. But still, subhanAllah, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu after conquering Mecca, he could have immediately ordered be tadmir Kaaba. He could have ordered the Kaaba to be destroyed. But instead, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knew that if he were to do that, it would create more harm. That, that th those people, uh, subhanAllah, they would react in a way which in the future may be harmful for, for, for the community. So he says, Law, if it wasn't that your people had just became Muslim, the narration of Malik and the Muatta, I will order the Kaaba to be destroyed and rebuilt on the foundations of Sayyidina Ibrahim. Look how he thinks for the future, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Sayyidina Amr ibn Khattab wants to cut off the head of Abdullah ibn Ubay, a known munafiq, the head of the hypocrites, the Prophet says, no. Because he knows that people will say the Prophet وسلم, he killed his Sahaba. When Allah says, فَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهِ Don't insult the gods of other people because they will insult Allah. This is a strategy for the future about protecting harm. And of course, in protecting harm is the achievement of benefit. Why I say this is especially for our scholars who are doing a great job. As I mentioned, the North American Fiqh Council, which I'm, I'm a member of. Uh, Amja is doing incredible work and our ulama, you know, really trained people are really thinking deeply about these issues. One of the things that we have to consider is, are we going to be reactive or proactive? Are we going to take on the risk of strategy or stay cowards in a reactive way? Listen to the statement, I was going to mention it earlier, but I wanted to save it for now, of Sayyidina Sufyan al-Thawri, who had his own madhab, subhanAllah, although it's gone now. He said, إِذَا أَدْبَرَتِ الْفِتْنَةُ أَرَّفَهَا النَّاسِ He said that if a trial happens, everybody knows it. Like, if it already happened, right? Everyone now can be reactive. وَإِذَا أَقْبَلَتْ But if it, it's in front of people, لَا يَعْرِفُهَا إِلَّا عَالِم That if it's in front of people, the only one who will know how to deal with it is the faqih. So that's why now as we move into Ramadan, as we move into the summer, I want to challenge our brothers and sisters to think about 
How do we, excuse me, I have a daughter who seems to have put her string on my glasses, mashallah. Um, Sheikh Walid Basuni who talked about, you know, can we pray tarawih, virtual tarawih, can we have virtual Jumu'at? These are things I, I hope that the councils and the ulama at least will engage. Uh, we know the answers tend to be related to ancient opinions about distance and being in the same place as the Imam. I, whether, whether the opinion is no or yes, it's great to see people like Sheikh Walid and others actually engaging in this because this is what's in front of the community. What about down the road? What's in front of the community? So the next is that you have to have enough guts and support to think about the future, not just be reactive. The Prophet he of course, was able to riba and then he says all of the riba that's owed is forgiven for the people this is thinking about the future sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the last is that i want us to understand that there are going to be times when things happen to which there is no precedent and that there are differences on the philosophy of islamic law for example imam al-razi uh, imam al-isnawi jamal al-din isnawi the writer of nihayat the school and others, they said that in the maqasid sharia actually the first objective of sharia is hifz al-nafs, is to protect people. And they put this in front of hifz al -deen. And I agree with this because al-wasail yuqaddam tuqaddam ala al-maqasid. Right? Or hal al-maqasid tuqaddam ala al-wasail. This is an issue in Islamic law. Do, do means come before the goal or the goal come before the means? Does wudu come before salah or salah before wudu for example? So we find, you know, this discussion that actually those ulama like Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam uh, Al-Isnawi, Imam Al-Razi, they say that hifz al-nafs, nafs, excuse me, yuqaddim uh, ala hifz al That protecting life comes before protecting the deen. Now we saw most people, when they wanted to keep the masajid open, I read yesterday in a, in a newspaper that there was a country where people, non-Muslims, were saying, what is wrong with Muslims? We're not supposed to be gathering. We're not going to bars. We're not going to clubs. We're not going to cinemas. We're not doing this. But they're going to the mosque to pray. All the churches and synagogues closed. What's wrong with them? And they called the police on them, subhanAllah. And we'll find some Muslims. Wallahi, the masjid has to stay open. If the Muslims are dead, it doesn't matter how many masajid are there. So, the last point is that we have to return to the maqasid sharia. When we're calibrating answers for which there is no historical precedent. And we also see this in the time of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, who, for example, creates jails, right, out of hibb al nafs, nafs, to protect people. We see that Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, who once to initially disagreed and then agreed with Tadween al Quran, right, compiling the Quran. We say Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, so many of what are called fatwa maqasidi, where he gives fatawa, which are based on the maqasid. And we need the lay people who are not well versed in Islamic law, Islamic law is an eight year degree, who are not well versed in that to trust ulama and trust to the mashayikh, to trust the scholars who give fatawa, which sometimes doesn't necessarily make sense to them. It's okay to ask and engage, of course, but you know, don't fire the imam because he gives a fatwa you don't agree with. The, the, the organization shouldn't ban an imam from a conference because he or she may say something that they don't agree with. Again, respecting differences. That's why when someone came to say that Imam Ahmed, I said, I wrote a book called The Book of Differences. He said, no, call it The Book of Mercy. So the last point is as we move into the future, we are going to have to create independent-minded jurists and thinkers who are able to answer questions that at times have no historical precedent. That goes back to the statement. Who said that you know there are going to be times and moments where the texts are limited, the number of legal texts in the Quran around 500, but the actions of people don't stop. So there has to be a way to create a relationship between the two. That's why Sayyidina Imam Al Nawawi, Rahimullah, said, "Faqad yakumu Muslim maqam al You know that sometimes the scholar sits 
in his relationship with the people like the Sharia is in relationship with the Shah. That's why there's an axiom that says uh, You know that the statements of the scholars to the non-trained people are like the verses of Quran and Hadith for, the non for, for those non-trained people. L like the Sharia to the scholar, that is to the people the statement of the scholar. So I, I, I want us to think deeply about these things as we move through Corona, you know, outside of kind of the romantic, romantic reflections. We need to think, we need to move beyond entertainment to education. And we need great scholars and fuqaha to, to be able to be free. Sometimes the masses of the Muslims will not free the scholar, will not allow the scholar to exercise his or her intellectual rigor out of their own fear because they don't know. And also at the same time, the scholar has to teach the people. So as we move forward, inshallah, we ask Allah to remove this bala, this trial for us, and this waba. We should think about what I said. Number one is that we put preventing harm in front of bringing benefit in most situations. Number two, that we tolerate differences. Number three, that we communicate effectively with all people, mashallah. Uh, number four, that we think about the maqasid al-sharia and putting pre preventing harm to life before establishment of the religion in most situations. And the last I said is that f for us to really move forward, we have to think about the, the importance of giving scholars the freedom to work. You know, one time I was sitting in a mosque with a scholar, he did his PhD in Usul al-Fiqh and al-Azhar, and he gave an opinion and a brother came to him and said, no, I want the opinion in my book, in my madhab. He said, well, then go ask your book. What's, what's the role of the scholar as Sayyidina Al-Qarafi said, you know, Jumud al-Qutub dal mudil, just to, just to quote books all the time, is going to lead yourself astray and other people astray. And that takes me to the last point. And this is to my elders and my young brothers and sisters. We always tell elders to pass the baton to the younger generation. No, 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 no. Instead of passing the baton, we need to both figure out a strategy where we're both involved. What I see is that the youth want power and the old folks want power. No, 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 no. There needs to be a nuanced approach that respects everybody and listens to everybody and figures out a strategy that employs the youth to be best in what they're good at and the elders to be best in what they're good at. Because man lam yarham kabirana wa la sagirana falaysa minna. Who doesn't respect our elders and our youth is not from us. There's both. So subhanAllah, you look at Sayyidina Musa, Abuna, Shaykh and Kabir, those girls, they said our father's an old man. Sayyidina Musa, he helps them, he uses his youth and physical power to help. And this old man facilitates marriage for Sayyidina Musa. Look at the relationship. Um, so I, I would say by saying for Islam to truly function in the future, there also has to be not a passing of the baton, but a nuanced strategy that employs youth to do what they're good at and gives them the freedom to rock it and also empowers our elders to stay part of the community, something that they've invested in for 30, 40 years. People just don't want to be turned out and fired. People that built massages, built institutions, donated their time and wealth, they have a right to be part of this process. May Allah SWT bless you. I want to encourage you to support Why Islam. Uh, Why Islam is a transformative organization that does great work. May Allah bless you. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.